All right, anyways, you need to know the characters. Osiris. Osiris is the old king. He's Dumbledore for all intents and purposes. He's the old king. He's the, he's the, the spirit that established the Egyptian state when he was young. He was a great hero, but now he's old. And he's, will, he's archaic and he's willfully blind. That's Osiris. He has a brother, Seth. Seth is Set. And Set is Satan. Because the word Satan comes from the word Seth and Set via the Coptic Christians. So, so, so he's a precursor to the Western idea of Satan. You have Isis. Isis is queen of the underworld. And Isis was the goddess of a religious structure that prevailed across thousands and thousands of years. Isis. And you have Horus. Horus is a falcon. And the Egyptian eye, everyone knows that eye, right? The eye with the open pupil, that's Horus. And Horus is a falcon because falcons can see way better. They can see better than us. They can see better than anything else except for perhaps eagles. And they fly above everything. Zazu in the Lion King is Horus, right? And Mufasa is Osiris. And Scar is Seth. And there's no specific representation of Isis, but the closest there is in that story is probably the Queen of the Hyenas that's played by, uh, who's the actress? Um, hmm? Whoopi yes, Whoopi Goldberg. That's right, that's right. Because she, they inhabit, she's like the Queen of the Underworld, right? She's the Queen of the Hyenas that live out among the death. But, okay, anyways. Seth, Osiris, Seth. Isis and Horus. Here's how the story goes. Osiris is a great king. He established the Egyptian state. You could think about him as the embodiment of, the, of Egyptian custom and tradition. You could think about him as the thing that the pyramid represents. All right? But he was great when he was young, but he's not young anymore. He's old and he's willfully blind. And what that means is that he doesn't see what he could see. He refuses to see what he could see. Why is Osiris old and willfully blind? Because that's what culture is. It's a paternal spirit that's old and willfully blind. And it's always that way. Always that way. And the reason for that is because it's a construction of the dead. The dead aren't alive. They can't, so they're out of date. They can't update themselves anymore. And you inhabit their corpse. And that's actually what happens in an earlier story that I'll tell you next week. The, the, the early Mesopotamian gods inhabited the corpse of their father, roughly speaking. Anyway, so... Osiris was great and, and when he was young, but he isn't young anymore. He's old and he's willfully blind. He won't look where he knows he should look. He doesn't have the energy or maybe he doesn't have the spirit. His brother Seth is not a good guy. And Osiris knows it, but he underestimates his malevolence and power. And so Seth wants to rule the kingdom. So what does that mean? It's easy. Every stable society is, is threatened by willful blindness and malevolence, always. Every bureaucracy has that proclivity to stagnate and to become blind. That's why corporations die all the time. That's why a uh, uh, Fortune 500 company only lasts 30 years. It's why we have to have elections. It's to stop the dead from staying in control for too long. Seth, Osiris turns a blind eye to Seth. Seth is happy about that. Same thing happens in The Lion King, roughly speaking. Seth one day waits for Osiris to make a mistake and to be weak. And he attacks him and he chops him up into pieces. And he distributes the pieces across the entire Egyptian state. In fact, the Egyptians regarded their provinces as pieces of Osiris' body. Okay, so now you can't kill Osiris because he's a god. And why is he god? a god? Because he represents the spirit of structure. And there's always structure. It can't be destroyed. It always reconstitutes itself. It can be <laughs> hurt and broken into pieces, which is exactly what happens to Osiris. Things fall apart. Why? Because they get old and because malevolence undermines them. That's what the Egyptians were trying to sort out. Okay, so Seth distributes his Osiris all over Egypt so he can't get himself back together. Right? Things fall apart and they can't be brought back together. But the spirit of Osiris still lives in the pieces. So what happens? Order is demolished. What would you expect? Chaos emerges. That's Isis. Isis is queen of the underworld. She's Osiris' wife. Order and chaos, just like the yin and the yang. 
Order collapses, up comes the queen of the underworld. She's looking for order. Chaos cries out for order. She's looking for order. She goes all around Egypt trying to put Osiris back together. It's a state of chaos. She finds this phallus. She makes herself pregnant with it. And what does that mean? Well, it means it's like, it's like Geppetto in the belly of the whale. That thing has the potential to re-emerge. The, the, the thing that collapses into its pieces is still alive. It, it can unite with the chaos and produce something new. That's the story of the dissolution of structure into chaos and then its revivication. Isis makes herself pregnant. She goes back down to the underworld. She gives birth to Horus. Horus is the Egyptian Aish. He's the son of the great father and the great mother. He's a, he's a messianic figure. And in fact, much of the mythology that described Horus was extracted without much modification and then attributed to Christ. Very much, and you, you can read about the parallels. You can read about it online if you want. But there's any number of parallels. And of course, there is the mythology that the Jews came out of Egypt. And of course, the Christians emerged from the Jews. And so there was a, a tremendous influence of Egyptian thinking on the development of these later ideas. And you see pictures of Isis with Horus on her lap that are virtually identical in content and form to the later pictures of Mary with the infant Christ. And that's the holy mother of God in the hero. It's, it's not a Christian motif. It's far deeper than a Christian motif. It's a human motif. So Isis, queen of the underworld, gives birth to Horus. And Horus grows up outside the kingdom. Why? In the underworld. Because that's what human beings do. You're alienated from your culture. Always. Why? It's old and dead and corrupt. And so that leaves you growing up in chaos. Uh, what would you call alienated from your fundamental culture? That's the story of adolescence Horus grows up he can see that's what differentiates him from Osiris. That's why he's a falcon He goes and has a fight with Seth and now the difference between Osiris and and Horus is that Horus does not Underestimate Seth. He knows exactly what he's up against He goes and has a terrible battle with him trying to get his kingdom back something else that's echoed in the Lion King story and well Horus and and Osir or Seth are fighting, Seth tears out one of his eyes. Now why? Because Seth is the embodiment of destruction and malevolence. And no matter how conscious you are, if you encounter that, even voluntarily, the probability that it's going to damage your consciousness is extraordinarily high. That's why people don't do it. So the eye is torn out, but Seth is defeated, and Horus uh, banishes him to the nether regions of the kingdom. You can't kill him. Why? Because the malevolent, destructive force that threatens states never dies. It's always there. You can only remove it temporarily. Now Horus is king. Pharaoh, king, god. He's got his eye. And so you think, well, he's going to just pop that back in his head and then he's going to be able to lead. He's going to be able to take his place at the uppermost pantheon of, pantheon of gods properly. But that isn't what he does. Mm -hmm. He takes his eye and he goes back to the underworld, just like Pinocchio going into the depths to rescue Geppetto. And down there is the spirit of Osiris, who's, who's extant as a kind of half dead ghost. And he gives Osiris his eye. Now Osiris can see. So, what does that mean? You go down into the chaotic wind threatened by malevolence even to the point of damage to your consciousness. You go down into the chaos and you find the dead spirit of your tradition and you give it vision. And so, provided with vision, Osiris regenerates and then Osiris and Horus go back up to, to, to the world, linked together and rule jointly. And the Egyptians believed that the Pharaoh, who had an immortal spirit, was the embodiment of the conjunction of Horus and Osiris. And that's what gave him sovereignty. And so you think about how brilliant that is. The Egyptians are trying to puzzle out who should lead, who should be Pharaoh, and what do you have to be if you're going to be Pharaoh in order for things to work? You have to be awake to malevolence and chaos, and you have to embody your tradition. And that puts you at the highest pinnacle of the dominant structure. It's, and that's the same as, it's the same thing, it's the same thing as 
the battle between the gods across centuries or eons and the emergence of the highest possible moral virtue as a consequence of that competition. 